All right, everybody, welcome to the Weekend Interview Show. I'm your host, Philip Dur, Administrator, and our first guest is Jason Sorens. He's a lecturer at the Department of Political Science at Yale, where he got his Ph.D. Turns out he wrote his dissertation on secessionism. Should be interesting. And he is the founder of the Free State Project, an attempt to get freedom-loving folks from all around America to move to New Hampshire. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, I'd like to ask you first, where did you get the idea for the Free State Project? Well, it actually came from two sources. Uh, the first was my own research at the time I was working on my dissertation on secessionism. And I found that in most countries, uh, the regional level is becoming much more important, um, corresponding to the state level here in the U.S., um, both because of economic globalization and because of, uh, well, secessionist movements and movements for cultural autonomy around the world have made government start to decentralize, give more powers back to the local level. Uh, so that trend should be coming to the United States soon, even though we've had a trend of centralization over the, over the past century or so. I think that trend will reverse and we'll see the state level uh, being much more important. Uh, but the other reason that, uh, that that gave rise to the Free State Project was simply the failure of libertarians and constitutionalists to make much headway at the national level in Washington, D.C., and it was clear after several decades of trying that we weren't about to uh, take over Congress and the presidency anytime soon. So if we're going to have an effect, we've got to concentrate our, our resources in a single area where we can actually win. And uh, how's it going so far? It's going pretty well. We, uh, we started in fall of 2001 and started uh, collecting sign-ups from people who are willing to move. Uh, to a single low population state where we could have a significant political effect. And uh, we got about 5,000 signatures by August of last year, and we held uh, an election among those, those people who signed up for which state we would choose. And there were 10 candidates, all low population states, and New Hampshire was the victor. It uh, defeated every other state in one-on-one -on -one comparison, had an absolute majority. So uh, New Hampshire is a state we've chosen, and some people have already started to move to New Hampshire. About 30 people, I'd say, have moved since the state was announced October 1st. And uh, we're looking to get 20,000 people ultimately signed up to move. And one key provision of this is that uh, you don't have to move until we get 20,000 signatures. So the key is that um, we're, we're not going to – it's not risky because uh, we're not going to make you move if – if uh, if we don't get 20,000 signatures. But if we do get 20,000 signatures, we'll be on the brink of something truly historic, I believe. And uh, you'll want to be a part of that. Okay, well, two questions. First of all, why New Hampshire? I heard it's really darn cold up there. And uh, secondly, <laughs> why, what's so magic about the number 20,000? Well, New Hampshire is cold. In fact, all the states uh, we were considering happen to be cold states. Uh, because all the low population states are, are pretty cold. Uh, over the past few decades, people have been moving from the north to the south. So all the, all the states in the south and the Sun Belt are, are fairly uh, high in population now. Um, so, so we figured we would uh, choose a place where we can actually have a, a really good chance of ultimate victory. Um, and uh, as far as 20,000, there's nothing really magical about that number. Um, we, we just wanted to pick some number so that uh, that would be sort of the trigger for, for people to start making plans to move. And as it turns out, the research we've done has shown that 20,000 people, if they're activists and not just voters, uh, should be able to uh, win an absolute majority in New Hampshire. Um, and, and so we've, we've drawn on some other parallels uh, in both Canada and the United States to show that once political parties or political movements reach a certain saturation uh, in the population, uh, they, they tend to have um, major they tend to gain majority support after that. So 20,000 would definitely be above that threshold. Why don't you go into that a little bit? Exactly what kind of uh, 
What is it? What percentage do you need before the rest of the percentage catches on? Sure. Well, obviously it's an inexact science, but a couple of things we looked at were uh, the Parti Québécois, which is uh, the party in Quebec that wants Quebec to secede and become an independent country. Uh, obviously, we're not a secessionist movement, but there are some parallels because this party was a new movement. It was founded in the 1960s. Uh, it had to grow within a two-party environment in Canada with a similar electoral system. It's working at the provincial level. So there are a lot of parallels to what we're trying to accomplish just right across the border in New Hampshire. And what we found was that uh, once they reached about 60,000 members, which is in a population of about 6 million there in Quebec, uh, they became the second largest party. And then once they got to 100,000 members, they became the largest party in Quebec. So that same percentage, if you carry it down to 20,000, that's about 1.2 million uh, population in the U.S. It's about uh, one activist for every 60 in the population. And uh, that is about New Hampshire's population right now. Uh, so, and, and another factor uh, supporting this idea is simply uh, that New Hampshire is in many ways fairly libertarian or, or freedom-loving already, uh, and so it, it shouldn't be uh, that difficult to, to swing it further in that direction. What are some uh, examples of that that make New Hampshire already kind of leaning our way? Well, it has the lowest state and local taxation in the country, apart from Alaska, which uh, benefits from oil revenues. Um, and so that's a major factor. It has no seatbelt or helmet laws for adults, and just minor factors, but they show that there's a, a spirit of, of tolerance and, and uh, individual responsibility for your own life. Um, New Hampshire has a large state house, 400 members, that's uh, a member for every few hundred voters. And so it's very easy for independents and, uh, and people who aren't uh, part of the political establishment to win election there. Uh, and they have just $100 a year salary, which they haven't raised since 1889. So that shows you some of the uh, frugality uh, of New Hampshire's government. Uh, they've got the lowest uh, government employment of any state in the country. Um, they have the second lowest dependence on federal expenditures, federal dollars and subsidies of any state in the country. Uh, so there, this is a state that's uh, independent in the sense that it's, uh, it's not dependent on federal dollars. Uh, it has very low taxes, has a tolerant approach to, to people's personal choices. So in many ways it seems, uh, it seems right for a libertarian movement. And also I would point out that its, uh, its job market is, is quite good and its economy tends to be uh, fairly advanced and diverse uh, with a lot of, lot of high-tech going on in, in New Hampshire. So that also helps people uh, find jobs and helps make the citizens of New Hampshire more confident that they can succeed in a free market environment. I wonder uh, what kind of reaction you've gotten from people who live in New Hampshire about this announcement that their state has been chosen as the Free State Project? Well, we've got a lot of reaction, as you might expect. Uh, we've got, got a lot of media coverage in New Hampshire and still are. And uh, I would say that we're not very popular among the newspaper editors, uh, but uh, all the uh, most of the, the messages I've gotten from people living in New Hampshire have been very positive. And they tend to say things along the lines of, uh, if you really believe what you say and are really interested in... Uh, uh, in, in promoting the ideas that, that you espouse, then you're welcome here. Uh, this is a live free or die state. So, uh, so you libertarians are just right in line with that. That's what many of them say. And of course, there are a few, uh, few people, a few liberal democrats, there are a few, um, uh, a few socialist types who, uh, who have uh, made negative comments. But even they often want to know what we're about and want to find out more about the project. And I found that uh, that we were given a respectful hearing in New Hampshire. And, in fact, we're already having an influence there. Uh, the governor of New Hampshire, Craig Benson, actually signed up as a friend of the Free State Project before we even voted for New Hampshire. So that shows some of the level of commitment uh, that some people in New Hampshire government have uh, towards the ideas that, that we're promoting. 
Wow, that sounds really good. I, I guess it's to be expected that the Democrats are going to scream bloody murder. Yeah, in fact, uh, even before the election, before our, uh, our, our vote on the state, the, the Democrats had made some positive noises about the Free State Project, but after the election they tried to turn it into a political football, and they've been essentially screaming bloody murder ever since then. Uh, but no one seems to pay much attention to them. Uh, and searching around on the Internet, I found something from a newspaper in Montana, I guess, when they were uh, still in the running for being the state, where uh, they were saying thank you but no and basically trying to compare you and your group to the Montana free men and uh, how if Abraham Lincoln was around, he'd come and kill you because you want to secede from the Union. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, surprisingly, we got a very negative reaction from all of the political and media establishment in uh, Wyoming, Montana, and Idaho. Uh, the the governor of Idaho said we should go to Montana. The governor of Montana said we should go to Idaho. Um, I went to Vermont as well, spoke to the mayor of Burlington. He said we should go to New Hampshire, so we ended up taking his advice. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I guess we all know that New Hampshire really does have a very strong political debate. You know, their primary always comes first and means the most and that kind of thing. That's true, and that, that could be something we leverage eventually and have some effect on the presidential races. Obviously, at first, we're going to be working at the state and local level, trying to uh, privatize education um, and abuses of eminent domain and asset forfeiture, uh, deregulate utilities and things like that. And then after that, we're going to try to use our federal representatives, um, Tenth Amendment uh, lawsuits, and, uh, and other types of pressure to try to get powers back from the federal government back to the states where they belong. All right. Now, that's my kind of rhetoric. Let's go through that a little bit more there. Okay. <laughs> you say you want to abolish public education. Well, I would say, uh, yeah, we want to separate school and state. Uh, we want a, a free, competitive, private system of education in which people are free to opt for homeschooling or private schooling. Um, or unschooling or any type of schooling that they prefer and not have to to fund a monopolistic government system through taxation. Uh, there's one thing we found out from, from uh, the events of the past 15 years is that the Soviet economic system doesn't work, and yet we're still trying it with our schools uh, with devastating effect. Do you worry about poor people not having an opportunity to get an education if they can already afford one? Well, that is a concern, and ultimately, uh, we're trying to create a better society, and uh, we're, we're trying to help both on on the social and cultural level as well as the political level. And so one Free State Project member has started up an organization called the Liberty Scholarship Fund, and they've already raised enough money to pay for one one child scholarship, and they're continuing to raise money. And uh, I think uh, I think that will end up being a very uh, a very useful endeavor in the future, and hopefully we'll be able to extend that to hundreds, if not thousands, of New Hampshire children. Uh, I also think you have to to think about the way that you go about separating school and state. And people might not uh, take kindly to the view that um, you want to uh, dynamite the school buildings and fire all the teachers. Uh, <laughs> That's not quite what we want to do. Uh, what we can do is convert these public schools into true community schools, nonprofit schools, um, remove the, the tax subsidy, make them competitive, uh, but also keep them there as uh, a beacon for the community, a place uh, that can still offer a universal education okay. to everyone. You know, I really appreciate that, the private but nonprofit. I think um, people have seen... On TV, I know I've seen a couple of documentaries about the Edison schools where, you know, basically it's like letting Exxon buy your local junior high and turn it into a for-profit thing. And it seems like it's really been a disaster on the same order that the government schools have. But I think the idea of, you know, local community schools run privately but not for profit for the actual purpose of teaching people. Um, right. I really like that idea. And you can even give the teachers some role in governance. You can have a board of directors that's partially elected by the teachers, partially elected by parents, and a few elected by, say, donors in the community. And 
that would be a way of giving teachers some direct stake in in uh, children's education, and it might also be a way of politically neutralizing some of the opposition that uh, public school teachers would otherwise have uh, towards privatization. Yes, because really they're the most against it. Yeah. That's right. All the teacher unions, they're not going to put up Absolutely. unless yeah. you, you, like you say, find a way to bring them in on it, make them think it's their idea. Definitely. Give them some ownership stake, if you will. Now, you also mentioned forfeiture uh, and how you'd like to repeal it. What the hell is forfeiture, and why would you want to repeal laws that allow it? Well, uh, asset forfeiture allows the police to seize your property uh, if you're suspected of a crime, and you have to prove that you're not guilty before you can get the property back. So it reverses uh, the common law tradition, which is recognized now in all democracies around the world, that you are innocent until proven guilty. And in fact, it relies on this questionable assumption that property can be guilty of crimes, even if the, the owners are not. Uh, so there have been some terrible abuses of this. Uh, people who uh, had thousands of dollars in cash taken from the airport uh, simply because they were, say, black or simply because they had cash and the police thought only drug dealers would have that, that much cash on them. And then they have to go through years of court battles to, to get their, their money back or, or even their homes or, or property. This has happened to many people. And so I think we need to do away with that completely. And... That sounds crazy. Are you sure you're not describing some country in Europe somewhere? I mean, this is America, right? <laughs> One would have thought, but uh, but no, America is often leading the forefront in these sort of uh, crimes against human rights, I would say. You also mentioned there are uh, lawsuits concerning the Tenth Amendment. You want to elaborate on that? Sure. Well, uh, this is an idea to limit federal intervention to the areas authorized by the Constitution. Uh, fancy that. Yeah, that's uh, the revolutionary sounding. You're <laughs> not going to get shot trying that? <laughs> uh, I, I hope we're not that far gone yet. But uh, but anyway, of course, the, the Tenth Amendment says that any power is not explicitly delegated to the federal government are reserved to the state to the people. And so this means that, for example, there should be no federal role in, in crime control, for example, um, treason and counterfeiting are the only crimes actually mentioned in the Constitution and the only crimes that the federal government is authorized to prosecute. And yet, today, of course, we have a, a massive war on drugs. We have um, fed, we federalized all kinds of criminal activity from uh, carjacking uh, to, um, to carrying a gun within 100 feet of a school and things like this. And so it's time to start to rein in some of those abuses. And there's growing evidence that the federal courts are actually sympathetic now to that federalist argument uh, that the federal government has gone a little too far. And so the, the Ninth Circuit Court in, uh, out west, for example, has, uh, has made some noises to the effect that if a state were to, to bring the argument that drug prohibition is properly a state and local matter, not a federal matter, that they would rule in their favor uh, against the federal drug war. And so we're starting to move in that area. And I think uh, if if we fully fund an office in state government purely dedicated to rolling back uh, federal gun, drug, and other kinds of, of laws that are clearly unconstitutional, I think we'll make some progress. And even when courts don't rule in our favor, uh, the federal government may decide, hey, it's not... It's not worth it to enforce these laws in New Hampshire anymore, or it's not it's not worth it to pass any new laws uh, criminalizing new activity. Uh, let's start rethinking uh, the approach we're taking. And you know that really sounds like a pretty good idea. With you know actually having a state government filing the lawsuit, it's pretty hard to keep that off of CNN. That's right. You know, at least you get and the publicity out of it. That's right. And there's some other clever things that states can do to get around some federal law. So this uh, this federal law that said you can't have a handgun within, I think it's actually a 1,000 feet of a school. Uh, Montana, the, the exception was for any law enforcement officer. A law enforcement officer is allowed to carry within school. Yeah, of course. And, Congress and the cops are always exempt from the law. Right. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so... 
the Montana legislature passed this law saying that for the purposes of federal statutes such and such, every citizen of Montana is a law enforcement officer. Oh, good. I hadn't heard about that one. I like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that's what they did. So there are lots of clever ways that we can, we can try to use state law to get around what the federal government is doing. And, of course, some localities and even some states now are, are trying to effectively nullify uh, the USA Patriot Act or parts of it by ending local cooperation with federal authorities and things like that. What about conscription? Is there a way that you could make New Hampshire a safe haven for people who don't want to be kidnapped and forced to fight in the military? I, I have to uh, have to think about that. I, I, I believe that there must be a way, and uh, it may be that uh, we make it illegal for for um, uh, the federal government to send out um, these uh, registration forms uh, to to people in New Hampshire, or we can make it illegal for people in New Hampshire to return them, or something like that. Some some sort of uh, state law that will um, will will cut off the the source of conscription at the root uh, through this um, uh, selective service registration. I think there there has to be a way for this for the state government to do that. Now, you talk a lot about uh, interfering with the plans of the national government, but what kind of laws would you like to see repealed on the state level if, if the libertarians can actually get control of the government in New Hampshire? Well, obviously, I, th I do think that uh, creating competition in schooling uh, is uh, a primary concern, because once you do that, you start... Uh, you eliminate the, the pro-government propaganda that you get in the schools, and you raise up a new generation of people who are largely self-reliant, who are taught uh, um, real facts and real theories and not, uh, and not simply, um, you know, patriotic jargon and things like that. And so, so once we get that generation in power, um, we'll be much more in a position to, to make further changes. Uh, but... Obviously, at the local level, there are other low-hanging fruit zoning laws, laws uh, regarding building codes, again, eminent domain and asset forfeiture. Uh, we could we could deregulate um, electricity, water, uh, other types of local industries, um, and we could cut uh, state taxes very substantially once we've, uh, for example, privatized education. That would be a massive. Uh, will allow for a massive tax cut at the state and local level. Um, so once we do that, we'll create a, a very strong and robust environment for businesses and taxpayers. That will draw additional people to New Hampshire. New Hampshire is already drawing people because of its low tax rate, but um, these kinds of moves will, will increase that several fold. And other states are going to have to take notice. And other states are going to have to start trying the same things in order to avoid losing their tax base to New Hampshire. Jason P. Sorens is our guest on the weekend interview show. He's the founder of the Free State Project. Now, Mr. Sorens, you know that many people all across different political spectrums object to the libertarian argument for really environmental reasons. Right off the bat, they say, oh, sure, you just want to deregulate business and let them dump whatever mercury you want in my drinking water. So uh, I'd like for you to... I'd like to give you a chance to defend yourself against that accusation, if you can. Well, libertarianism is basically a, a theory of property rights, that, uh, that that people have rights in their body and the things that they create that are inviolable. So if companies or individuals are poisoning other people or defrauding them, there's a, there's a strong case to punish them, to punish them harshly for doing that. So I support environmental regulations that uh, place limits on um, pollution and other kinds of what, what economists call negative externalities, things that I do that, that ultimately hurt you. Um, it's legitimate to punish me sometimes for those things. What I, what I would object to in, in the environmentalist agenda is the idea that, that government power should be used to uh, prevent people from using their own property. Uh, the way they see fit, so long as they're not hurting others. Um, so much of the environmentalist agenda has to do with um, locking out human activity from broad areas of, of the earth and trying to recreate uh, some kind of um, fake synthetic wilderness 
uh, by, by keeping people out. And while I agree with the, the basic objective of preservationism, that we want to have some wilderness, that we want to, uh, to retain, for example, many of our cultural landmarks and things like that, I don't believe that, that government power should be used for those purposes. I think uh, once you do that, you're, you're initiating a conflict of values, and there's no one who can win in that zero-sum game. Uh, it's, it's either the environmentalist or the property owner who wins, and one or the other has to lose. I think a more proper solution is to respect property rights, and environmentalist groups can then buy buy land that they want to preserve and put it in trust. And that is already happening to some extent in, in New Hampshire uh, and, and elsewhere in the country, um, the use of land trust for preservation rather than uh, government power. And so I would support that development. Very interesting. Uh, also, I'm interested in... Uh your dissertation on secession, I found Googling your name on the Internet that uh, you got your Ph.D. from Yale University by writing about secessionism. I wonder if you can explain uh, what that dissertation was about and maybe some interesting things you learned while uh, writing it. Well, secessionism is a hot topic ever since the early 90s when uh, Yugoslavia broke up, the Soviet Union broke up, Czechoslovakia, Ethiopia, Indonesia have all broken up. Uh, so we seem to be moving towards a world of, of smaller states. And I think that is on balance a positive thing. And I wanted to study looking especially at so-called advanced democracies, Europe, North America, um, what, what are the causes of secessionism, the causes and consequences. And the fact is that um, in the last few years, there's been an explosion of secessionist movements in advanced democracies. Uh, many of you um, probably have have not heard of uh, the secessionist movements here in the United States. Uh, the Alaska Independence Party, for example, elected a governor in the 90s. Uh, some people think that if uh, some state tried to secede nowadays, the U.S. government would punish it with military force. I actually don't think uh, that's uh, an option anymore. I think that's changed in the last few years because of the precedent that's been set in Canada, in Britain, uh, where secessionist movements have openly uh, tried to gain independence, and the assumption is that if a majority of people vote for it, it has to be peacefully negotiated. Uh, resort to force is not an option. And this was made even clearer in the case of Yugoslavia, where the U.S. government actually intervened on the side of secessionists, and it would be very difficult for the U.S. government to go Milosevic on, on some state uh, nowadays. Um, well, well, and they, wouldn't, they wouldn't say they were uh, acting like Milosevic. They'd say they were acting like Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> Possibly, although it's instructive what happened in Alaska when the Alaska Independence Party became strong. Uh, the U.S. government responded by giving the Alaskan government greater control over oil revenues which allowed the Alaskan government to set up the permanent fund, uh, which pays every man, woman, and child in Alaska to live there. And that obviously decreased secessionist sentiment there quite a lot. And most people are in Alaska are now comfortable uh, staying within the U.S. Um, so there, the, the federal government is, is um, keener to use, I think, concessions, financial uh, and political concessions, rather than trying rather than letting a stir or a big ruckus um, uh, develop. So I, I do think, um, I, I may be wrong about this, but I do think that the days of, of violent secessionism are past us, and we're now reaching a stage in which countries will start to peacefully um, break up. I don't know whether that will be happening to the United States anytime soon. I doubt it. Um, the United States is still fairly strong. There are smaller secessionist movements, emerging. There's the League of the South once the southern states to secede. Uh, there's the Second Republic of Vermont, which wants Vermont to secede, and apparently is, is quite strong and quite popular in the state. Um, when I was speaking with the mayor of Burlington, just a, uh, he's a progressive, in fact, the left of the Democrat, and uh, he seemed to think that secession was a pretty good idea <laughs> when we talked about it. So it's, it's something that, that could start to happen within the next few decades. I think it's overall a long-run trend, though. And in the long run, I think uh, the United States is... Oh, no. Did we lose you? Are you still there? Oh, man. 
All right, everybody, a little bit of technical difficulties there, but uh, we're back with Jason Sorens, the founder of the Free State Project, in which they're trying to uh, recruit 20,000 libertarians from across the country to move to the state of New Hampshire. And uh, we were discussing uh, secessionist movements around the world and in the United States when uh, we lost our phone connection. So uh, I, think, I believe you were finishing a point about secession movements in America. Well, I was just going to point out that uh, the U.S. will, in the long run, I think, either break up or it will return to constitutional federalism because it's just too large and too distant from ordinary people right now. Well, and constitutional federalism really was a republic of sovereign states in the first place, right? <laughs> That's right, and that, that created the system of checks and balances and uh, allowed people to have a great deal of say over their elected representatives. Now, the Free State Project about getting the Libertarians to move to New Hampshire, that's not necessarily advocating that New Hampshire secede from the Union, right? This is a different subject. Or no, it's I not. I, you're, you're right. I, uh, I have an academic interest in secessionism and, and try to think about what might happen in the future. Uh, but the, the Free State Project actually doesn't take any um, explicitly political stances itself. Uh, we just want people of a certain political philosophy who believe in individual rights and small government across the board uh, to move to New Hampshire, and then we'll all start working towards that goal. And we don't know exactly how it will end up, but we know that we're going to achieve much, much more than we could have spread out as a small minority throughout the country. And, you know, I really like that. You and I joked earlier about... The con you know, reinstating the Constitution as a revolutionary act, but really it's not. And actually, uh, we could just steadily repeal stuff and, and uh, hopefully have uh, unconstitutional laws struck down and return to a federal republic system of government without a revolution at all. It would just take a revolution in the House of Representatives, really. That's right, and it's going to take an in incremental approach, I think. Uh, people have to see that freedom works in one area before they accept it in another. And I expect that that's uh, what's going to happen. Yeah, I think so, too. Also, when I was searching around on the Google this morning, I found something about a proposal to make a free state out west as well. Do you know about that? Yeah, it's a, um, a small group of people who used to be involved with the Free State Project who didn't want to move to New Hampshire. And so they're starting to lay the groundwork for eventual uh, free state out west. I think it will take several years for that to get off the ground. Uh, and they don't want to draw anyone to one of the western states who might otherwise go to New Hampshire. Uh, we all realize we have to start somewhere first. Um, we can't end up with 50 free state projects or, or we're back to square one. Um, so uh, for the time being, uh, the, the main free state project is uh, focused on New Hampshire. And for now, how many people have already moved to New Hampshire as part of this? About 30 people have moved since October. And we're actually not asking people to move until we reach 20,000 signatures. So these are right. people who are moving early. And uh, I'm sorry, how many uh, signatures do you say you have so far? 5,000? Uh, yes, we've got about 5,600. Uh, so we've made up about 1,500 since October when... Um, when we actually released those who had opted out of New Hampshire. Uh, when people signed up before the state vote, people could opt out of any of the states. And so about 20% opted out of uh, each one of the states. So uh, we were back down to 4,000 right after New Hampshire was announced, and now we're back up to about 5,600. Oh, that's good. And, you know, that fifth will probably sign back up once they see that it's actually going to happen, if it does. And, yes, a number of them actually already have. Good deal. You know what you guys should do is uh, buy an ad in the New York Times on the 4th of July with the big Live Free or Die slogan. That'll get them. That's a good, that's a good idea. We actually were featured in a front page story on the New York Times uh, back in November. And so we got a lot of members from that. And I actually had a lot of students coming up to me uh, from my classes about that article. Good deal. You know what you also should do is uh, make friends with Chris Matthews or somebody on TV. That's really where the numbers are. That's a good point. Uh, we've had a couple of TV appearances, but not not in the last few months. And so uh, we'll be we'll be pushing on that definitely. 
All right. Well, we've already uh, hauled ass through all my list of questions here. Do you have any closing comments, anything I should have asked you about that I forgot to? Well, not really. I mean, I would mention the, the website. I don't think we've actually given out the address. Oh, it's, yeah. Uh, it's www.freestateproject.org. Or if that's too long to remember, we also have a, a shorter one, freeme.org. Uh, so either of those will take you to our website. And it's actually a, a really rich uh, load of, of resources that you can find there, uh, from essays and articles to media reports about the Free State Project. You can sign up online. You can join our discussion forum and uh, vote in different polls going on. So it, there's quite a lot to, to get involved in in the Free State Project, and things are always happening rapidly. We've got something going on uh, several times a week somewhere in the country. Well, good for you, man. I, I'm proud of you. I think that's a great thing, and uh, I really wish you the best of success with your with your thing. And, and you know, if 20,000 people move to New Hampshire, I'd just might sign up. We'll see. Well, you should do that. You know, if uh, if you decide to go into radio, I'm sure there'll be a market there for for what you're saying. Hey, yeah, there you go. Finally, make some dollars doing this thing, huh? <laughs> Absolutely. Great. Well, everybody, Jason T. Sorens, he's from the Department of Political Science at Yale University, a full-time lecturer there, and he is the founder of the Free State Project, which you can find at freestateproject.org and also at freeme.org, you said, right? That's right. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you very much for having me. I enjoyed it.